Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next session of CME Palooza Fall. I am Scott Kober, one of the co-producers of CME Palooza, and I would like to welcome you to this session entitled Gamification in CME, Balancing Entertainment and Education. This session is sponsored by Integrity CE, DKB Med, and Red Med Ed. Our moderator for this session is Katie Robinson. Katie is the Senior Director of Outcomes and Analysis at Vindico Medical Education. And you will be meeting the rest of the panel here shortly. But before we start, as with all of our CME Palooza sessions, I would like to um, acknowledge the sponsors of CME Palooza Fall. Our gold sponsors, Daiichi Sankyo, Med Learning Group, Physicians Education Resource. The, our silver sponsors, the Academy for Continued Healthcare Learning, Academic CME, Antidote Education Company, Catamount Medical Education, DKB Med, Hippocrates, Helio CME, Integrity CME, or Integrity CE, excuse me, Medscape Education, Platform Q Health Education, Prova Education, Red Med Ed, and Vindico Medical Education. And finally, our bronze sponsors, Answers in CME, AxDev, Bonham Continuing Education, Creative Educational Concepts, CMEology, Excalibur Medical Education, Infograph Ed, Global Education Group, MedIQ, Partners for Advancing Clinical Education, Paradigm Medical Communications, Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, Primed, PVI, RMEI Medical Education, and Wright Medicine. So there are three ways to ask questions during this and all of our CME Palooza fall sessions. You can use the CME Outfitters text line to send in a question. Our number is 267-6660-CME0263. You can tweet your question to us using the CME Palooza hashtag. And if you are watching this on our live page, and if you click on the watch on YouTube in the lower left-hand corner, It'll open up the session in a new window on YouTube, and you can enter in questions using the YouTube chat function. Um, I'll be monitoring for questions throughout this session and chiming in um, to ask questions of our panelists. Now, since this is a gamification session, um, not surprisingly, we will be using some gaming technology during this session. So there will be a series of audience response questions using Poll Everywhere. Uh, thank you to our they are a sponsor, Broadcast Beat Studios. And so to participate, you can either download the Poll Everywhere app and join the presentation entitled CME Palooza 005, or type in the following URL in a web browser, www.polleb.com backslash CME Palooza 005. So this will actually be, uh, we'll be having some um, competitive uh, questions Throughout this session, we'll be using some audio, some, some kind of fun things to keep everyone engaged. So finally, our speaker disclosure, please note that the opinions, discussions, and or conclusions expressed are those of our panelists and do not represent an endorsement by or a position of their employer, its parent company, or their affiliates. So before we get started with the um, ARS questions and our gamification materials. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Katie and she's going to help introduce our panel. Thanks, Scott. Um, all right, just want to let you guys know that our goal for today is really to show you the benefit um, of gaming and how it can um, sort of increase engagement and the other things that it can do for your um, CME programs and how you guys can implement it successfully. Um, so as Scott mentioned, we are going to be having a game as part of our panel today. Um, you can win points. There is a leaderboard, leaderboard um, and you can win bragging rights if you win this game. So um, I just, I'm going to kick it over to our panelists. Um, and we'll start with Debbie just so she can introduce herself before we get started. You bet. Hey, good morning, everybody. Great to be here. My name is Debbie Sosoka. I'm Partnerships Director at AKH Inc. Uh, Michelle? Hi, Michelle Haneke. I am Director of Education Innovation at the American College of Radiology. And Sam? Hi, I'm Sam Glassenberg, CEO and founder of Level X. Great. And so, Scott, if you could sort of kick us off, we're going to do a couple rounds of Name That Tune just to wake everybody up this morning and get everybody having some fun. 
Okay, great. So the way this is going to work is uh, you will see the questions pop up on your on your on your phone. Um, the audio will play, and then you will be able to respond to each question. So give me a minute to um, queue up the audio for these. And here is our first question. So hopefully everybody's got their phone out with poll everywhere. Okay. Select the show that corresponds with this theme song. Give everybody about 20 seconds for each of these. All right. The correct answer is American Idol. 77% of people got that one correct. Okay. Here is your next. Oh, first your leaderboard. Lots of people got that right. So it's going to be a big tie to start out with. <laughs> okay. Select the show that corresponds with this next theme song. I don't know if I would have gotten this one right. Correct answer, the newlywed game. Wow, 83% of people got that one correct. Very good, everyone. Let's see our leaderboard. Still lots of people, two for two. Okay. Here is our final question of this first segment. Select a show that corresponds with this theme song. Answer is of course family feud. 89% of people got that right. Still lots of people all correct. Um, I think this is an example of a poorly balanced game. <laughs> <laughs> well, our game will get more balanced as we go on. So yeah. so we do have one unscored ARS question um, to kind of kick off the session before we turn it over to the panelists. So here's our unscored question. Have you implemented gamification into your CME programs? Yes, no, I'm not sure. So we'll give people a couple seconds on this one. There is no right or wrong answer, obviously. Okay, so it looks like a pretty even split. Yeah, between the I'm two. glad nobody's not sure. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm gonna close this poll and I'm going to turn it over to Katie and the group to start our discussion. Yeah. So actually, Scott, if you could ask the next question, um, we're just going to sort of kick off with that. This is a scored question. Okay. We have one more scored question. Okay. Sorry about that. So there is audio for this as well. So let me queue up the audio. Uh, I don't think there should be audio for this one. Oh, I put audio clues oh, with all these. That's questions. okay. <laughs> okay. So here is... So here is the question, and then the audio clue will come up momentarily. Okay. Question is, what was the first game show to appear on television? <laughs> yeah. 
Here are your choices. Spelling bee, truth or consequences, the $64,000 question, or you bet your life. Answer. Wow. Spelling B, 33%. Um, the song was No Rain by Blind Melon. If some people remember the video, it was the little girl in the bee costume dancing around. <laughs> wow. All right. So let's see our leaderboard now. Oh, only four people have gotten this one right. Okay. Right. Awesome. Now, the, the reason that we ask you this question is um, the, the correct answer is spelling bee. It actually aired in uh, 1938. Um, in more or less words, it was a spelling competition. Um, and the reason that we, we asked this before, you know, this really doesn't have anything to do with the content of this presentation, but this is a learning strategy. Um, you know, in, in answering this question, you guys self-reflected on the fact that you don't know what the first game show to appear on television was. And this is just one strategy that you can use um, to incorporate gaming into your programs. It doesn't have to always be um, a, an, a question um, related to content that, that was presented to you, but now you guys have all learned what the first game show to appear on TV was, and you can see that this is an affecting learning strategy. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, sit and, I'm gonna um, pass this over to Debbie. And Debbie, I'm hoping that you could talk to us from your perspective, what do you think is driving sort of this trend of using gamification in continuing education? Um, and how do you think it's being perceived from both the perspective of learners um, and educational providers? Yeah, thanks, Katie. Good morning, everybody. Great question. Um, and again, for as many answers that I can think of uh, to the first part of the question, there are probably two and threefold more. But I think from a provider perspective and supporter perspective, it's um, you know always the quest for innovation, trying to find something innovative, trying to find something that more closely aligns to maybe some unique learner preferences. And what's kind of really cool is come out of this as gamification has evolved is the intersection of the technology with brain science. And I know, Sam, that's something that's near and dear to your heart. You know, oftentimes we've always thought of games, especially in medica medical education, kind of hesitantly because it's just considered a form of entertainment. When in fact, there's a lot more that goes into it when you intersect brain science into the game in the sense that you understand how to activate and stimulate um, learners to participate. And, and in turn, what, what I've personally seen from my experience out of that effort is some really cool and unique outcomes. Um, anyone that knows me, I'm a self-professed data geek when it comes to outcomes, that's where I entered into the industry. But you know, some really interesting insights can be derived, some more in-depth insights too. Um, so that's where I've appreciated in introducing gamification into CME. So I also think that, um, you know, whether it's, you know, an electronic game or a medical mobile app or a virtual simulation, you know, all of these things kind of fall under this umbrella of what's termed as, you know, um, gamified training platforms. So when you look at some of the studies or maybe amongst those 60 some odd percent that have already introduced gamification into their educational program, you, you, you've seen, you bear witness to the fact that it has, you know, promoted learner and it's increased, um, you know, engagement with learners for sure, just virtually by design. Um, but it also, as we all know, allows for a risk-free risk real world environment for people to apply their knowledge. And depending upon the format, it's also been demonstrated to enhance collaboration. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I thought of, I, I only knew where gamification was introduced to CME from my own personal experience, but I was curious to know where it may have been introduced at the very beginning into CME. And it was interesting to find that the term gamification was first introduced in 2008. What makes it difficult or what it seemed to make it difficult was the fact that that term was not introduced into the scientific literature until there was a bit of a delay. 
So when you look at systematic reviews to look and understand the true impact that gamification can have on learners' increase in knowledge, transfer of knowledge, you know, it it's you, there was an article that I found uh, that was published in 2020 that kind of highlighted the results of a variety of different game-based educational formats. And the earliest one that I found in that paper was in 2013. That was targeting NPs, PAs. It was focused in COPD. It included avatars, leaderboards, quizzes, badges. But the end result was that the report clearly demonstrated that there was an impact on those learners in terms of their foundation of knowledge and application of knowledge. Um, one of the interesting things too is, and I know Katie, more, more recently, you and Tyler Nelson had an article that was published last year, I believe it was in June, mm -hmm. where uh, again, you had reported increased transfer of knowledge, engagement, robust outcomes. So definitely, you know, even within our own, you know, immediate world, we have publications that can speak to the impact of these game-based learning platforms and formats. And I'm not going to belabor that point because I know, Katie, we have some time um, later on to talk about, you know, the variety of, you know, outcomes that can be derived from these game-based uh, platforms. So I'll hit to the second question, you know, how do I think it's been received from learners and providers? You know, like everything else, it's, we, you know, when you see people come in and out, it's not for everybody. I mistakenly thought that I would be able to use game-based learning to attract the younger demographic, hopefully, you know, residents, fellows, but that wasn't necessarily the case. And, but what I will say for sure is I really don't think it's for the cheaters or those folks we finally refer to as cheaters, the in the out, let me claim my CME. Um, I think what I've seen is it does appeal to a variety of, of learners as it relates to their demographics. I think what's important, and you know, if anyone on the panel wants to chime in, you know, I think what's important is how you, unless it's something like Jeopardy, which is so obvious to know what you're coming into, it's really important to tee up, you know, that learner experience right up front so they know what they're getting them in, themselves into. Uh, the other thing that I found was really important with gamification because it is for many something new is to make sure that you've incorporated a series of prompts for learners when they're in the activity to know what to anticipate next, to know how to use the platform to get to the next phase of the education. Um, those are the things that I think are really important. I will say, and, and I, you know, this session I don't think is designed to imply that gamification is going to replace traditional CME. Um, I, I think for sure we would all agree that there is a place for it. I think that where gamification really helps to augment a curriculum is the, the fact that it provides more of an experienced based interaction where learners can, can apply the knowledge in the skills. Um, Katie, maybe this is a good time to punt things over to Sam, but Scott, I think we have another question for the audience. We do. So this will almost awesome. be, this will almost be a post-test question since I believe that you mentioned the correct answer during. Kind of like some of our faculty too, huh? <laughs> so let's see how closely people were paying attention. Okay, so here is our next question. In what year, approximately, was gamification first introduced in CMA? Here is your song. Okay, 
correct answer is, whoops, that's not good. <laughs> Hold on. Let me go back. Correct answer was 2010 to 2015. That song was 2012. It ain't uh, known by Jay yeah. Sean and Mickey Minaj. I'm sure everyone's a big fan of that song. Right. And here is our new leaderboard. Ooh, now we're back to a eight-way tie for first place. No one yes. has gotten all five questions correct. Wow. All right, so we've got two more questions a little bit later. So I'm going to get rid of this and turn things back over to Katie and the team. Yeah, that's interesting that Scott, you described it as a post-test question because sometimes introducing gamification can be as simple as a question with the you sort of, you know, incentive to participate to win these points or or whatever it is. And we'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, but Sam, um, I did want to I wanted to speak to you because many of us ha in attendance have participated in game played games. We've been to CME programs that have used games. Um, but I want to sort of with your expertise and from your perspective, can you share with us what you think the components of a good game are um, and, and how is a good game made and how can we use how can we develop good games for CME? Sure. Um, well, I will say that the best practices come from the consumer video games industry, where we've been testing these techniques for 30 years on about 3 billion people, um, which at this point includes basically everybody. Almost everybody's playing games, even if they don't consider themselves gamers. Uh, so a little bit about me. Yeah, I mean, my, my background actually is from the consumer video games industry. I spent my career at companies like LucasArts and Microsoft making games played by tens of millions of people. Uh, at Level X, what we're doing is specifically using these same technologies and these same neuroscience based, as I mentioned, these same neuroscience based techniques to train medical professionals. So we have over 800,000 medical professionals who are earning CME credit while they cut, cauterize, inject, diagnose, treat, totally interactive virtual patients. And what we're doing though is we're using the same, as you said, you know, as was mentioned, the, the, um, these techniques are all based in our human beings have evolved to learn this way. And let me let me explain how that works. So in the in, in the video games industry, like I said, we, we've distilled the neurochemical recipe for driving learning and driving deep understanding uh, and instilling of mental models of complex systems. And we've been testing this. We basically figured out how to do this on any audience. Expert game designers know how to hit the perfect balance of reward and frustration, challenge and skill to maximize release of neurochemicals in the brain at the right frequency to maximize learning. And that's why these techniques are so effective. We do gaming not because it's innovative, we do it because it's substantially more effective. Uh, the example I always like to use for this is Angry Birds, which I assume everybody's played. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Pretty much. So, have you ever wondered why Angry Birds is so addictive? Like why we still play this game a dozen years after it came out? We've evolved to play Angry Birds. It's a game that helps your brain develop a mental model of parabolic flight. It's a physics puzzle. And if you think back to what happened you, when you played Angry Birds, well, what you, Angry Bird hopped in the slingshot, you pulled it back, you fired it at the Tower of Pigs, and what happened? You missed. And if you recall, the pigs laughed at you. <laughs> Why? It made you frustrated. Second bird hops in, you aim better, you fire, you get closer to the tower, but you still miss, and you get more frustrated. Third bird hops in, you aim like a champion, you fire... And it's glorious. There's explosions and animations and pigs flying everywhere and the music changes. All of this is deliberately designed to trigger a dopamine release in your brain that actually reinforces the neural pathways that you used on the last fire. This is why two hours later, you're firing that bird between two narrow obstacles at 50 yards and why 50 hours later, you're still enjoying playing the game. Now, we didn't invent this neuromechanic in the games industry. It's existed in the mammalian neuron for tens of millions of years. This is precisely how our ancestors learned how to throw a spear. Try, miss, 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 hit. Okay, whatever the neural network was that we just used reinforced those neural pathways. 
And so we've been, what we've learned is you can apply these same, this is, this is how humans have evolved to learn. You can learn the physics of parabolic flight, or it can use the same methodologies to train medical professionals and drive education in almost any category where you need to develop a mental model of a complex system, whether it's you know, diagnosing rare disease, longitudinal patient management, adherence of guidelines, understanding mechanism of disease, understanding, um, understanding which patients are indicated for which treatments, surgery, all of these things are puzzles, strategy games. And when you employ it that way, you can drive, you, you can drive outcomes that are far, it's not only more entertaining and more fun, it's more effective at learning. Um, but I like to sort of contrast this to a lot of the sort of gamification that we see, which is sort of taking something that's, you know, boring or not interactive and, you know, slap, slapping on a quiz or, you know, giving you badges to complete it. Like we didn't, quizzes weren't fun in the second grade and I don't think they're fun now. And we didn't even invent badges in the video games industry. We stole that from the Girl Scouts. So I, I fundamentally believe that like how to do this right is to look at what's working in the consumer games industry um, and apply deep game design that's deliberately designed to drive the education and the mental models that you're trying to instill. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Um, and, you know, sort of um, with that, we're going to switch switch gears now and, and talk to Michelle about the subtitle of this talk, right, which is balancing this entertainment with education and how do we make sure that we're not throwing in too many bells and whistles and, and losing that educational component of it. So, um, Michelle, is this something that you could speak to? And, and in your experience, I know you've you've integrated a lot of games into to your programming's um, sort of best practices that you can share. Certainly. Thank you so much. Yes, I think gamification is a wonderful idea. I am a gamer myself. I love to play games. I'm always playing board games, video games, any kind of games. I think um, it's very useful in education, but I think there is a balance that we need to use when we do gamification with education. Um, you know, the game, game gamified processes make the education engaging and interesting because we all know getting CME can be kind of trying sometimes when you're doing the same things over and over again. Um, and gamification kind of lifts that up a little bit. Um, I think one of the biggest things you need to worry about is you don't want to lose the performance goals in the interest of fun. Um, sometimes too much gamification, you can cause you know unintended distractions where you're not getting across the education that you're trying to promote. Um, so gamification is, is not a silver bullet, but is certainly a fantastic aid for certain content. So, you know, when would you use gamification for your content? Um, there's some criteria and it's all out there. You can go and look it up, but really you want to know what uh, your idea of success would look like. You need a success criteria. What is the purpose of this? Game, of this gamified education. And, you know, does it resonate with your learners? Not all learner groups um, like gamification. So, you know, you have to think about your target audience as well. Um, is it, you know, tied to a business need or educational need? Um, you know, it's always fun to create a game, but is the you know, is it really necessary? Is this content that you're trying to educate, is it pertinent to what your what your end goal is? And a little bit what Sam was talking about is, you know, is the game based on sound instructional theories? You know, uh, we can do something very simple or something very complex, but it all needs to follow some instructional theories. And as with any game, you need to have really good identified instructions and a defined story for the game. Uh, if the game doesn't make sense, you're not gonna get your educational purposes across. Definitely. Um, I think we, it's a good time now, Scott, to ask our next IRS question. So we've got a few a few questions that came over the uh, CME Outfitters um, Q&A line. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a few questions and this is probably good for Michelle and for Sam and, and probably Debbie and anybody can probably answer these questions. Um, so, so, so the question that came in is, who is typically a part of the team developing these gamified CME activities? So in our case, we have 
we, we have 130 people. So it's some of the same game designers who worked on, you know, Call of Duty and Words with Friends teamed up with, we have internally a team of biomedical engineers and MDs on staff. Plus we're typically working with, we have a stable of hundreds of physician advisors and contributors that we're working with to make sure that not only the content that we create is accurate, but that it, you know, that it closes specific educational gaps. Um, so typically when we're doing this, it's a collaboration of art, design, engineering, uh, and deep, deep medical expertise. Okay. How about you, Michelle? I'm sure that you don't have 150 people at your disposal. No, we don't. Uh, we, re we rely on some instructional designers that we have on staff but a lot of the content and really the guidance comes from our uh, members, our radiologists who, uh, who need this education, so. Okay, um, so, so one other question um, from the CME Outfitters Q&A line I'll throw at you. Michelle, you, you sort of mentioned something about um, uh, some, some learners like games, some learners don't. Um, are you aware of any research showing which specific audiences tend to prefer gamified activities? No, I haven't really looked into uh, learner groups. Uh, maybe Debbie or Sam have some information on that. But I do know, and it also bases, is based on the type of content you have. Not all content is suited for game, game gamification as well, so. I reinforce yeah. that too, Michelle. I just, um, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of thought it was a way in which to start to capture the, the younger learner demographic and bring them into the fold sooner. Um, but that wasn't so much the case. You know, I think what made the difference was, and again, not for everybody, it's just the way you tee it up and the, the way that you support them throughout the course of the game so that it doesn't, you know, they don't get frustrated. I think that's the point where I've seen people leave is the frustration level because there isn't clear guidance of next steps when they're in the game. Sam, any, any. Yeah, I, th I think if your audience doesn't enjoy the game, you've made the wrong game. I mean, gaming is not like there are people who play games and people who don't. That's like, that's like asking like, oh, do you watch movies? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess there are some people who don't watch movies, but they're a very tiny minority. That being said, within the medium of movies, there is a pretty broad range of people who like different genres and those genre preferences align differently with different demographics. So there are game genres that are played by older audiences. There are game genres that are played by younger audiences. There are game genres that bias more male or more female. What we've actually seen is within medical specialties, you'll see that actually dermatologists, their gameplay behavior is actually different from let's say gastroenterologists or cardiologists. So I wouldn't, gaming is not monolithic where it's like, oh, people play games or they don't. And if you want to attract a specific audience, then you make games. But if you don't want to attract an audience, you don't. The bottom line is who's the audience you're trying to attract based on that? What is the game mechanics that, that um, resonate with that audience? And obviously more importantly, what is the, what is the learning you're trying to drive and which game mechanics are the most effective at conveying that learning? Okay, great. All right, well, hopefully our poll everywhere game mechanics will, will continue to be popular here with everyone with our next question. All right, here we go. Which of the following is most essential when developing a game for educational purposes? Here is our song clue. Dancing crew, trip for two, nail the final interview. Game with Doug. Oh. Brand new month. Hold on. Here comes the song again. Come here, kid. It's a commercial. Give me a hug. The more you want to do, the more we want to do. Booster's designed for. All right. That was a commercial, so it didn't play the song that I wanted to. But I'll give people a few more seconds <laughs> for the answer. Get your COVID booster, apparently. <laughs> Okay, the song I was going to play was a favorite of mine from the 80s by LL Cool J called I Need Love. So the correct answer is content based on the educational need. The vast majority of people got that correct. Yes, that is wonderful. That's one of, you know, sort of the, the most important thing to remember when you're developing a game is not to let every all, all of the, the fluff get away from what you're actually there to do, which is to educate. Um, so 
uh, panelists, I'd like to sort of, you know, as we're seeing sort of a resurgence of live meetings, um, I'd like to see you talk about maybe some um, tidbits for things you need to consider when you're introducing gaming into live events versus web-based events. Um, and Michelle, I know you have some ex specific experience that you wanted to touch upon, um, if you want to sort of kick things off here. Certainly, I'd love to. Uh, yes, I think we need to make sure that we have an understanding that gamification doesn't always mean uh, app-based or web-based or complicated game. It could be something very simple. Um, you know, if you're doing terminology, you might want to do a crossword puzzle kind of thing. Um, here at the ACR, we had a need to engage medical students. And the way we decided to do that was to create a live escape room uh, where they had groups of medical students would come through and actually go through, solve puzzles. If anybody's out there had, you know, has done a live escape rooms, solve puzzles. We had ultrasound machines for them to use to solve puzzles. We've had uh, radiographs for them to read to solve puzzles. So we were getting the interest of radiology in there in a fun way. Um, other things uh, that you can do are like escape boxes, which are just little boxes that you could put different puzzles and stuff in if you have a large group. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, we don't go down one path of thinking that gaming is all electronic, it's all apps, it's all high tech. It doesn't have to be. It could be something very low tech and something simple that, you know, you can do in a live setting. Um, going back to the escape room, as soon as we launched the live escape room, COVID hit. So we had to uh, pivot and we had to make it into a virtual escape room, which was also very successful. Um, we were able to use it via simple low tech things like Zoom, um, JotForm um, or SurveyMonkey, you know, some kind of forming application that you might have to use. So uh, yes, definitely wanted to keep that in mind that, you know, you can gamify very simply and, and low tech if you needed to. How about you, Debbie? Anything you wanted to add? Yeah, you know, we're just starting to get into, you know, bringing gamification into the live setting. From my own personal experience, having observed it being applied several times at different medical conferences, you know, the one thing, and this actually the one that I think of most notably was the first time I had seen uh, like a Jeopardy format come into play. And it was really cool to see an entire audience get engaged and get excited. It was like, wow, this is really a great way to deliver content and everybody's a part of it, which may not be always feasible depending upon the number of people that you have in the room. But what was disappointing is I watched this energy just build and build and build thinking this is gonna go throughout and everybody's just gonna knock it out of the park. Then the Jeopardy game came down to the final three people that did really well and the rest of the audience was left out of the game. And it was just, you just saw the whole room deflate that if there was any way to continue to keep the audience as a whole engaged in as much as possible, I think that was the key takeaway for me. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of experience doing games that are played by anywhere from small, like 10 person lunch and learns to, you know, up to 400 people. Yeah, you never want to do what was described where like now the game narrows down to three people because that's terrible. The advantage that we have with these technologies is we can get everybody involved in the game. So we're doing games constantly where you have literally, you, know, you can have hundreds of people in person, remote, hybrid, it doesn't matter. Um, just on their phones, all playing either competitively or collaboratively to diagnose and treat virtual patients. So presenters getting up there, presenting a virtual patient case, and then everyone is either in teams collaborating, competing with each other to, you know, choose the right tests, um, you know, make the next treatment decision. And that, that either, often that actually, sometimes you want to actually have scoring and things like that. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you actually want to just use this as a means to drive discussion. So, all right, here's our, you know, challenge, right? Here's our patient case. We've got to thread the needle. We've got to make, you know, difficult decisions between, you know, certain treatments that might, may have side effects or patients with multiple comorbidities. All right, everybody put in your answer. And that drives discussion. And the beauty of the technology, because it just runs, digitally, you can do it in person, you can do it remotely, you can do it hybrid. 
it doesn't really matter. Everyone's just playing on their phones with a central screen projected big somewhere or, you know, shared over Zoom, MS Teams, or whatever this system is we're using, StreamYard. Yes, StreamYard. <laughs> Great. Um, thanks, guys. Okay, so in our, you know, we're wrapping things up here a little bit, but um, I don't want to leave without talking about my favorite topic, which is outcomes. Um, so, you know, there are definite benefits of gaming, which we've already talked about, but actually I think one of the um, true benefits is the amount of outcomes that can come out of these programs. So, um, Debbie, your background is strong in outcomes as well. So I just sort of wanted to have you talk about best practices for optimizing data collection and, and reporting um, and sort of what we uh, should think about when we're, we're designing games and, and executing them. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think my purview comes out of bearing witness to the pitfalls. Um, I think it's really important for anybody that's thinking about getting into working with any gaming platform. They, they truly need to understand your business. More specifically, they need to understand what data outputs you need. I have found in the past working with different uh, gamification platforms, you know, they're just looking at it from the standpoint of the individual learners and being able to to show, uh, you know, the customer how, you know, Sam X is doing compared to, you know, Amy Y. But, you know, in our world, we know, and, you know, it's a big miss in some respects that they didn't understand they needed to be de-identified. You know, a lot of folks really love this stuff and they'll come back and back again, regardless of whether they're going to get credit or not. So uh, having them understand, you know, what data you need, what data needs to be parsed out, and then as well, understanding that, you know, we need to present that, uh, you know, in different learner cohorts, you know, whether that's by specialty, um, you know, maybe new learners, older learners. But again, it's really important to make sure that the group that you're working with understands your business, understands the data outputs, because oftentimes they have these predetermined dashboards. And quite frankly, uh, you know, I, I have found them without at the risk of sounding terrible, you know, useless. So you've got, then you wind up taking the time to have them rebuild the dashboard to suit your needs. It's not that that's not available, but that's just one of the things I think of. And I think Sam, you know, you hit it, you hit it quite clearly earlier, if you want to expand on that a little bit more. Oh, sure. Yeah, Debbie, when I, when I hear about your horror stories, it like makes me want to bang my head on the table. I don't know who you're working with. Hey, it's I mean, all part of learning, right? It, yeah, it, in the video, exactly. Uh, in the video games industry, like no game would survive in the cons in a highly competitive consumer world with the kind of data collection and reporting that you're describing in the CME universe. Um, when you play any consumer, you go play Candy Crush, you play any consumer game, you're actually playing one of 100,000 versions of the game where on the back end, we're constantly testing, oh, what if we make this a little harder? What if we make it a little bit easier? Like, what if we adjust this or that? Add a tutorial, remove the tutorial. And they're constantly measuring and analyzing all of this data to derive insights to figure out how to make the game better. The, this, like, the, the video games industry is incredibly good at collecting huge amounts of data and then analyzing it in a very robust way and then making it available in you know, very flexible presentation models that allow us to run all sorts of different analyses. So this idea that like game platforms just have like, what do you use, like a predetermined dashboard um, that doesn't allow for things like de-identification and cohorting. Like we've been doing that in the games industry for 25 years. So, I mean, that's just par for the course, like when you're making a consumer game. And this just, again, goes to like more best practices that need to be brought over from the consumer industry in order to do this more effectively um, in CME. So, so, so Sam, we, we have a question that came in on the CME Outfitters Q&A line that I'm going to throw your way. So you, you, I think you mentioned a little bit um, that you've done some um, game games for hybrid audiences. So how do you do that when you have a live audience and an audience learning from, from home and, and to keep both audience interested and engaged? Oh, um, I mean, I can actually put up a demo at the end if you want for some of the things. It wouldn't be 200-person multiplayer, but it shows you how some of the technology works. But basically what you do is you put up, you integrate, it just integrates into PowerPoint and then um, just runs in a web browser and you can just put up a QR code. So someone is presenting 
in person, remotely, or hybrid. You just want to make sure that that screen that they're presenting on in the room is also projected over Zoom or whatever else. What that allows you to do is you can put up a QR code and then we have games where, and this is based on a model from the video games industry of party games. Um, uh, but basically what you can do is everybody can just snap that QR code. And then what's happening is you then on your own phone are participating in the game. And then the decisions that you make, I'll make it you know, onto a central I should say scoreboard, because if you're doing things like, let's say, diagnosing a patient, it's just going to show like, OK, what's the test you ordered? What's the dosage you chose? Um, you might have, you know, a race around the body to identify symptoms of a certain disease, whatever the mechanic is, the multiplayer element is just built into that. And so everyone's just playing on their own device. We basically use cloud gaming technology for this. Um, this is these are technologies that were you know, developed for, uh, you know, Companies like Microsoft, Project X Cloud, or PlayStation Now all run on these systems. We've just, you know, brought that over and adapted it for healthcare training. Okay, great. Um, Katie, I think there's one more ARS question. Um, I just wanted to add, you know, one more thing about the data collection. We talked a lot about quantitative data, um, and and I think you know, Sam, something you mentioned, and Michelle also mentioned at one point. There is also this aspect of qualitative data, and maybe if the game is designed to evoke conversation, or in Michelle's case with the escape room, um, you know, team-based interactions, and maybe there are questions that, or or um, challenges that the groups were, um, you know, struggling more with. All of this kind of data should also be collected because that that's also identifying sort of persistent educational needs, which we as educators can can use to sort of shape our future educational program. So while while there is sort of a heavy emphasis on the quantitative data that can come out of gaming, we, we can't forget about those qualitative insights. Um, and that's sort of my last point that I wanted to make. Um, so now if you wanna go ahead, Scott, and wrap up with our last question. This is the last right. one, guys. Last yeah. one, I'm rooting for Soup Bone to pull it out here. All right, here's our last question. All right, which of the following is a best practice for collection and analysis of game data? COVID-19 variants are now available. I'm gonna wait until the uh, commercial ends. Series, schedule an updated COVID-19 booster appointment as soon as you're eligible. Sponsored by Pfizer and BioNTech. All right. Here are our choices. Communication Breakdown by Led Zeppelin. And the correct answer, of course, is communication between the game developer and CE provider prior to development to discuss expectations. 63% of people got it correct. And now let's see who is going to win. Come on, Soup Bone. No, not Soup Bone. We have a four-way tie between Katie, Sam, Sandy, and TC. Wow. Great Congratulations. Job. Great job. Yeah. Pride, not prize, as one of our local radio stations here in Philadelphia often says. <laughs> so you all know I'm not a fan of using quizzes in general. I prefer other game mechanics. But if you are going to use quizzes, another best practice, um, don't have the right answer be 50% longer than all the other answers. It's a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> I did not write the questions. <laughs> no, that's how we learn. This is how we learn yeah. best practices. Yes, but I can I can say that 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 goes for pre post tests as well. It's always my one of my high school history teachers was notorious for that. Like you know, what was the key takeaway of the you know, Eighteenth Amendment choice A? You know, drink more water. Anyway, whatever. The <laughs> longest answer was always the right answer. Uh, Interesting. Um, Katie, I'll 
Any final thoughts from the panel be before we wrap this up? Yeah, did we have any more questions in, in the question line? Or if not, uh -huh. um, since we do have some more time, if um, all the panelists sort of want to share either a success story of how they've implemented gaming for educational purposes or um, maybe a challenge that you had to overcome, um, we could maybe use this time to discuss that. I think I just want to piggyback on your point, Katie. It's 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 all the data sets. And I think that struggle piece of it is really insightful um, because the degree to struggle, even though they ultimately get may get something right, kind of highlights where you need to reinforce learning. So any way that you can capture that is definitely beneficial beneficial. Yeah. How about Michelle or Sam? I, I totally oh go ahead. Go ahead, Sam. Michelle. Uh, I totally agree with that, Debbie. Uh, I know when uh, we've ever ever tried to, inst you know, use gamification in our processes in education, that we need to be very aware of the stumbling blocks, because there's nothing worse than getting frustrated users. Right. Sam, go ahead. Yeah, I think. Um... I, I, one thing I just want to make sure and I'll, I'll do a couple a couple of demos, but I think what's really important is when we think about where to use games, it's just use them deliberately. A lot of what I hear is a lot of sort of what I call recipes for chocolate covered broccoli, which is <laughs> all right. How are we going to take something that's boring, not fun, not interesting, and sprinkle on game elements, and now it'll be fun, and that's not very effective. Uh, I, I think there are certain there are certain concepts that you can learn in a lecture or from a video very effectively. And for those like shoving games on top of it, I don't think is worthwhile. I think there are a lot of things that you really, where you need to develop a mental model of a complex system, whether it's understanding complex guidelines or complex diagnoses or complex disease management or you know complicated mechanisms of disease, mechanisms of action, surgical techniques. Like these are the things where you really need to understand systems. And this is where games are really helpful, but you want to deliberately design games that are suited for those purposes. Um, I'm happy, I was like, for success stories, I like to just do demos. So I'm happy to like demo things if you want, whatever we have time. Um, yeah, yeah, we have uh, about three more minutes. I'm happy to, Here, here's an example in pulmonology. I like to show this. This is a, one of the CME cases in our Pulmax game. So like I said, we have about 800,000 people playing these games, our medical professionals, even more non-medical professional. I love this case because like this is an example of using game mechanics um, to convey uh, complex surgical techniques. So here, this is a case from Dr. Kyle Hogarth, at the University of Chicago. Uh, Carpenter's holding a bunch of nails in his mouth while he's hammering, accidentally inhales one and punctures his bronchus. Uh, and so I'm just, I'm doing this on my phone. Uh, you can download this yourself if you want to. Um, but what I love about things like this is it's not a multiple choice test, right? You have to actually do the procedure. And so here, you know, Dr. Hogarth, when he attempted this first, he came in with his end, there's the nail, you can see it, came in with his endoscopic forceps, uh, tried to remove it. And what he discovered is no matter what angle he came in at, he simply could not get that nail to budge. What he realized was the bronchoscope will bend in the t at, at the tip, but only in one direction. So he goes, all right, in order to do this, what I need to do is reorient myself. So the bend is in the direction of the nail. Oh, I'm not doing a very good job. Let's see if I can get it. Um, here we go. Come in at the base, grab it. And now when he pulls the trigger, he's able to remove it. And so these are examples of how you can use games to, you can use games to convey a complex system, right? In this case, it's advanced endoscopic maneuvers. And we're not scoring you based on, you know, whether you answer multiple choice questions correctly, we're scoring you based on time, blood loss, accuracy. And when it comes to things like diagnosis games, it's how effectively are you able to diagnose and eliminate differentials, things like that. So it's about, you know, it's less about like quizzing and more about how can you identify what differentiates an expert from a novice and then create a scoring rubric that does just that. Yeah, very cool. I think that's a you know sort of a wonderful um, example of how a game can be used um, for more uh, performance-based activities. Um, you know, maybe that's not the type of best game to bringing it all full circle. The not the best game for a sort of transfer of knowledge and um, and um, but you know there's 
definitely be mindful in the game that you're choosing for your educational goals and purposes. Um, and I get, unless there's, Scott, do we have more questions? I saw you pop up. Um, no, no more questions came no over. Um, okay. So, so, so we're right, we're right on about time. So this is great. Um, so just a few, few reminders for people, um, for those who are watching this session, any other session, um, we do have a brief survey link on the live tab to get a sense of who's watching CME Palooza fall. Um, it's only a few questions. This helps us plan for the future. Um, speaking of gaming, for people who like money, we have uh, the CME Palooza scavenger hunt is going on right now. Um, so you to participate, go to the website of our special promotion sponsor, Broadcast Beat Studios. The URL there is on your screen, www.broadcastbeatstudios.com. And search around. It's a scavenger truck. Look for the CME Palooza logo. Click on it and see what happens. So we're going to keep that up um, through Friday. So for people who are watching the recorded version of this, you do have a couple days to, to participate. Um, we're going to have 10 winners of $100 Amazon gift cards. And um, with that, um, there is no need to refresh your browser to view the next session. Just look on our live page and click the appropriate session link. And I'll start shortly. Just a reminder, all these sessions are archived on the um, on our archives, also on the agenda tab. Thank you to Array for sponsoring the CME Plusa archives. So with that, I would like to thank Katie and Debbie and Michelle and Sam for their participation. And thank you to everyone for watching. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.